When I was 21 years old, I had what seemed to be food poisoning, until it turned out to be non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Everything went slow motion. This was cancer. After the shock, I geared up to act, only there was nothing to do. Your best bet, top oncologists told me, is to sit tight and hope that science comes up with something better. So I returned to my senior year of college, Outwardly, everything was the same, but nothing was the same. I no longer fit into my life. My friends were full of optimism and momentum about forging into the real world. I'd been too, only my real world was suddenly too real. The truth is, we all walk around with question marks dangling over our heads that we blissfully ignore. But now, I had specifics. I knew exactly what could kill me, my stage four lymphoma diagnosis. I had to do something, or anything. If there was a healing herb, I was brewing it, and oh, they smelled putrid. I drank vile tasting tinctures. I was visualizing and meditating and biofeedbacking. When my dad read that a preservative may have anti-cancer properties, and that preservative was in Twinkies, I added a daily Twinkie alongside my wheatgrass shot. <laughs> I was so hopeful that something would work. I began to fret. I wouldn't know which thing it was. and would have to keep all of this up forever. But none of it worked, and I was back to figuring out how to navigate the quicksand of worry and what-ifs threatening to pull me under only around a thousand times a day. So here's where I found some inspiration. And it's going to sound nuts. I was watching VH1 Behind the Music, the, <laughs> the story of Billy Joel. Now, for those of you who haven't seen this episode, Billy Joel's adult life also didn't get off to a good start. His debut album was a miserable failure. He accidentally signed away the rights to all of his songs, and his girlfriend dumped him. He wrote a suicide note, then drank furniture polish. This is where I sat up. I thought, if only Billy Joel's future self could come tap that 21-year-old kid on the shoulder and say, put down the furniture polish. You're going to go on to become one of the most successful musicians ever. And you're going to marry Christy Brinkley. <laughs> this changed my entire outlook. I began to visualize my future self tapping me on the shoulder, mad about all the time I was wasting with worry and despair. You're going to be OK. And I was for a while. I did manage to buy time, nearly a decade, under the care of my beloved oncologist, Dr. Gordon, who enrolled me on clinical trials. But then in 2003, I took a dramatic turn for the worse. My only hope was the atomic bomb of cancer warfare, a stem cell transplant. The mortality rate on just the treatment alone, forget about if it even worked, was 25%. I knew too many people over the years who had gone in for a transplant and never made it out. Now I was staring into the abyss. I was terrified, and I was angry. The thing about a transplant, as brutal as it is, it's also miraculous. Your broken immune system is swapped out for someone else's healthy one. In my case, my only sibling, my younger brother, Jason's. Though Jason and I are opposites in most ways, our stem cells were a perfect match. But first, my own immune system had to be obliterated with lethal doses of chemotherapy. Like clockwork, my body began shutting down. My hair fell out, my teeth turned gray. I could no longer regulate temperature. My hands shook and bled. It was too painful to swallow, so I stopped eating. I was unrecognizable, so I stopped looking in the mirror. All I could focus on were the thousand ways to die. Weeks turned into months in the hospital, and as I became a ghost, so did the image of my future self. 
This was the final round of hope, and there's no prize for being the most hopeful patient on the cancer ward. Adding insult, my closest companion became the IV pole I was hooked to, a universally hated, wobbly contraption trailing me and tripping me, yanking on the tubes, carrying vital meds into my veins. When I had trouble maneuvering the pole to the bathroom, a nurse said, don't worry, we'll get you a commode to put right by your bed. A commode is a nice word for an adult potty. As anyone who's spent time in a hospital knows, you check your dignity at the door. But this seemed absurd. And then a ragged screw on the IV pole nicked my finger. Now, a normal person would shrug this off like a paper cut, but when you have no immune system, nothing is normal. I looked at my finger and I thought, after all this, it could come down to an IV pole? I had to do something, or anything, and it's gonna sound nuts. I decided to reinvent the IV pole. Now, I wasn't an engineer or a designer, but I was on a steady drip of morphine. <laughs> With a shaky hand, I began sketching ideas for a new pole that was stable and that maneuvered smoothly, that didn't have expanded screws or sharp metal edges. When a nurse told me that kids are often afraid of the IV pole, I added bright colors and surfaces that kids could decorate with crayons. Word spread and soon doctors, nurses, fellows, residents, the pharmacists all began asking about this new invention. I pushed through the pain and the drug haze and it felt so good to engage beyond just being a patient, to, to interact as as a person, all this time, I had watched everything I had thought define me get stripped away. But there was something left, what truly made me, me. Dr. Viktor Frankl is a psychiatrist and Auschwitz survivor who believes that our primary motivational force is a search for meaning, especially within suffering. Testing his theories against the most extreme suffering, Dr. Frankel noted a commonality among Holocaust survivors. Even in the bleakest hours, they all held on to some sense of their inner selves and to a vivid image of themselves in the future. Everything can be taken from a man but the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. For me, a bane of my existence had become a form of salvation. I found meaning in an IV pole. <laughs> Granted, I was still scared, and I didn't know if I'd make it out. But there was that tap on my shoulder, my future self saying, forget about the thousand ways to die. Just focus on making life a little better for future patients. A transplant sounds like surgery, but my brother's harvested stem cells arrived in an IV bag that was simply hung from the pole. As the infusion began, Jason, then a rebellious 25-year-old, jokingly whispered in my ear some of his defining characteristics. <sighs> you will start to crave Budweiser. <laughs> You will see nothing wrong with sleeping until noon on a weekday. While his personality traits didn't take hold, his immune system did. My body started regenerating and keeping the lymphoma away. That was 14 years ago. Today's stem cell transplant has improved dramatically with much higher success rates and much lower mortality rates. And as for the IV pole, I'd call the patent attorney from my hospital bed. I know, it sounds nuts. <laughs> but it wasn't like I had anything better to do. It's now in hospitals worldwide. <laughs> this is seven-year-old Brayden. 
He has a rare genetic condition called mitochondrial disease. A better IV poll meant so much to him. It was his birthday gift. And when patients learn the story behind the design, an IV poll offers them what it offered me, hope. To me, true hope is realism. It's about seeing the big picture with all the dangling question marks, then figuring out how to move forward. And true hope makes us realize, often in the midst of being tested, just how much we're truly capable of. Thank you.